Hi everyone, my name is Jasmine Jones. I am the film curator from the Houston Museum of African American Culture. Thank you so much for tuning in to Taste Test. I really hope you all enjoyed the show. I know I did. Um, we had a very wonderful conversation with uh, several of our filmmakers here. But before we get started, I would like to introduce the founder of Black Film Supremacy Film Festival, Nia Hampton. Would you like to say a few words to get started? Um, yes, I need to mute everything. Hold on. Because <laughs> I'm like watching us as we do this. So bear with me. Okay. And as a reminder to everyone else on Zoom, you might want to just put yourself on mute until you talk. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Nia. I'm the founder of BFS. And we're so grateful to Jasmine and the Houston Museum of African American Culture for figuring this out we thought we were going to be in person in houston in march but you know we are at the end of the world so now we're virtual in the beginning of a new world and it allows us to have our international filmmakers with us tonight which is really exciting so um jasmine i think you're going to talk about the run of the night and then we're going to get into the talk Sure. Well, first things first, um, I'd love for our filmmakers to introduce themselves um, and, you know, let everyone know which film you made. And then from there, um, if you have any questions from our filmmakers, you can type it in the chat. I will be moderating the chat. And at the end of the Q&A, we'll be able to share some of those questions. Um, so let's go from there. Let's start with Brittany, because you are the first person I see. <laughs> Okay, I'm unmuted. <laughs> My name is Brittany. You can call me Britt. I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, I did Doll Baby. I made Doll Baby in 2018 as part of a video installation for a show with the D.C. Contemporary, um, sorry, the D.C. Council for Arts and Humanities. And thank you everyone for tuning in. And next we have Keisha Williams. Hi, I made Queen of Hearts. Uh, it's a co-directed film with Lindsay Adau. Awesome. And Alicia Robinson. Okay. Hi, I'm Alicia. Uh, I directed um, Lazy Day. Um, it's basically a love letter to my dad, and it's my senior thesis film. Beautiful. B.T. Nayani. Hi, I'm Naini. I'm a filmmaker based in Toronto, and I directed the music video Miss America for the artist Wade Clark, um, who's a Jamaican-Canadian music artist based in Berlin. Awesome. And Nia June? Hi, guys. I'm Nia June, and I am the director, um, writer, and producer of A Black Girl's Country. Nice. And we have Anna Do Carmo. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Hi guys, this is Ana do Carmo. Um, I'm Brazilian. I'm speaking from Brazil right now. I directed the short film The Woman at the End of the World. Um, it was a film that started as a school project and then we um, we edited it and we put it into the world. Great, great. So I think we should just go ahead and get right into the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to let Nia take the lead on the first few set of questions. And then from there, uh, we'll have some information about Black Film Supremacy Film Festival and deadlines because it's still time, it's still enough time left to submit to this year's festival. And so let's get started. All right. Um, so the first question that we're asking all filmmakers is what was the genesis for each of your films? And you can just jump on in. I'll go. <laughs> um, the genesis. Um, basically, um, I had had some ideas going on in my head of just different small pieces that I wanted to create. And I was approached to create a piece for the DC Council for Arts and Humanities. Um, I knew that I didn't want to focus on just one story and go with it, that I would rather just take all the ideas and the stuff that I produce and put it all into one film. And um, yeah, that uh, pretty much how I got started. And from there, um, it's been in a couple other festivals. It recently showed with the Smithsonian. And yeah, that's pretty much everything I have to say. <laughs> 
I can go. Um, the genesis of this film was autobiographical. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, it's kind of maybe. Uh, it is essentially um, my take on the conversation around Black futurism. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that not only is there a Black future and will always be in existence, but we always have been in existence. And so I wanted to reimagine um, the Victorian era, which is an era that we see uh, oftentimes in the industry that's like it's just extremely white. And if there's a black person, they're a slave or a servant. Um, and I really wanted to make sure that uh, there was people who looked like me, like us, um, in that era um, and that we could have some fun just playing around and reimagining that. Um, I can go. So the genesis for uh, A Black Girl's Country, um, there was really like no particular moment or thing, but just something over time, me constantly looking at the TV and not seeing myself or talking to my students who are uh, young Black girls who felt like they weren't represented on television or just in magazines, wherever. So I was trying to think of something where I could kind of just put all kinds of black women in one just to show how multidimensional it is and the complexity of just black womanhood itself. Is that everyone? Hello. No, I didn't go. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the genesis of um, my film, A Lazy Day, I just want to do something personal, um, something that was um, moving for the audience. Um, so I basically wanted to do something that I could dedicate to my dad. So I wanted to base it off my childhood. That's it. <laughs> um, um, so, it started as a school project, actually. Somebody else, a friend of mine, started to write it and invited me to direct it. So, we co-created and we wanted to talk about this journey, this Black woman's journey, um, through uh, the seek of voice, I guess. So. Um, is a relationship between a mother and a daughter, but is also a relationship between a black woman and herself. And her being in the end of, of her own end of the world, I guess. Um, I think I'll go. Um, uh, Sway Clark, who's the artist behind the track Miss America for the video, um, he was originally working with a friend of mine, Alana Stewart, who is a musician and producer and director here in Toronto. And she couldn't do it at the last minute, so they needed somebody like four days or five days <laughs> before they were supposed to go to camera. Um, so as friends um, who worked together, I used to work in the music uh, industry in Toronto prior. Um, they needed someone to step in and really just manage the crew more than anything, because the vision and the um, story is based on Sway's mother's journey um, from childhood to adulthood and as a black woman from Jamaica and her experience with domestic violence. Um, so I came into it as a friend who was just trying to help them manage the crew really um, and carry out the vision that they had. So yeah, that was my role in it. Okay, now I think that's everyone. Okay. Um, so there is great variety in our program in regards to genre. Can we talk about, um, you know, how you got into the specific genre that you're in right now and what your like go to storytelling format is looking like right now and anyone can start. Would it be easier if I just chose people. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll start with Nia June. 
Um, so before, prior to getting into film, um, I'm, I was and still am a spoken word artist. Um, I write page poetry as well. So that's always been my primary form of communication. And the way I tell stories, it's just not very linear. And I feel like experimenting with images matches poetry. So that's kind of what kind of compelled me to create this. And I kind of, that's why I appreciate music videos and documentaries that focus more on images than the actual telling of a story. So I'm, I've been looking more into things like that and figuring out how to expand that as far as the genre and storytelling is concerned. Um, who, who wants to talk next? You guys aren't shy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go. Um, so I kind of got my start with my genre of filmmaking. Um, when I first went to film school, we were editing films on 16 millimeter and just the tediousness of everything, it really makes you have to, you know, think small, it's like a small concept and a small idea and a small budget especially for film students. So I think my style kind of has remained there because of course I write and I have really big ideas. I don't always have the resources, but I still would like to make movies and just kind of bring the ideas in my head to life. I can go. Um, so I, this was my first time um, experimenting with a period piece. It was my first dramatic film. I had made uh, one experimental short doc before. So I feel like I genre straddle. I feel like I kind of dip into what calls to me. Um, I think that I have really important stories to tell in a dramatic context and also uh, in a documentary context too. So um, yeah, I don't know, I play and I've kind of given myself the permission to do that um, because I think there's a lot of ways to tell our stories and that we should be represented in every single genre um, because, you know, we started them <laughs> essentially. So that's how I feel about it. Bingo. Um, so I guess we all started for me in photography. I am also a photographer and an editor, the director and screenwriter. Um, and we started, I think, in film school as well, like with experiments, um, making experimental films, making video clips. And then I started a small filmmaking company, an independent one, here in my city. And we have been producing a lot, actually. And uh, I have, I am part of different collectives of cinema here, independent cinema as well. And we look for funds, but mainly we produce ourselves as the girls. And this is how I go. I like to experiment a lot. I guess the woman at the end of the world comes from that experiment um, and I have made four short films so far and I am using this quarantine to write as many scripts as I can. That's it. Next. Um, so I always had a love for animation. I've been drawing and writing stories since I was like five. Um, so I didn't get serious with animation until my freshman year of college. Um, and that's kind of when I started actually making short films. Um, and I always liked the idea of a happy ending, um, with, which animation portrayed. So that's kind of how my love for animation started. And right now I don't really make films so much. I do a lot of concept art. So a lot of my concept art primarily focuses on 
people whose stories haven't been shared before. So I like to make stories about like people of color and cultures that aren't really expressed in media. Um, I think my original, I mean, I come from a background of like classical South Indian dance and theater and I do birth work. So I just, I'm in a whole bunch of different spheres and areas of work. Um, but really, I think my parents came from Sri Lanka as refugees in the late 80s to Toronto. Um, so being a community that's a, that was subject to genocide and still is in our home island, um, for me, like the news was always the thing I grew up watching. My dad is a very colonial, like addicted to the BBC coming from um, a former British colony. And so, you know, watching the news and reading a lot and being kind of a quiet, shy, awkward kid, um, like I would bring birth books to birthday parties and like not talk to anybody. And that's kind of who I was. And so I ended up going to school for journalism because I wanted to be part of um, you know, better documentation of communities like mine, where the truth of our um, colonial history and the impact of Pope's colonial violence um, was better documented. And then I was in school when the news was switching to the 24 hour CNN style of news. And I knew I didn't want to be part of those kind of sound bites. So documentary was the entryway. Um, but I always loved narrative because um, I grew up watching a lot of music videos and dramatic and comedic and, and animated films. And so it was all kind of, it just happened over time. Music videos happened in the last two years, starting with documentary. And now um, I just wrapped last year on my first uh, narrative feature. So it's kind of been an evolution, but really starting with my parents' um, particular journey of fleeing. Nice. Um, I didn't know you were a former journalism student. I'm kind of, I was like a media, and then I worked as a freelance journalist for years. So <laughs> um, this question is more so for Anna, being that you have the post-apocalyptic film and, you know, we're all in quarantine and living through the end of one world. Uh, we want to know, how do you feel about the work now? How has it changed from when you initially created and brought it out into the world? So I think the film started as an emergency for me to speak up my feelings, this solitude feeling that I guess all black women experience in the world. And the film is actually based on an album by a famous a Brazilian singer called Elza Soares. Yeah. Her album is called The Woman From the End of the World. Mm -hmm. And I guess that when I, I saw the film today né, as a quarantine person and I think the feeling was the film speaks what I wanted to speak and right now this feeling um, it's bigger than before, I guess. And uh, besides that, I think that I wanted to speak about Black women's end of the world. But I think that everyone can relate to the film Watchmen. And I guess that putting a kid into the film was also about reconnecting ourselves to our young selves. And that was my seek throughout the years, reconnecting myself with the child that I, that I was. And I think that the film is very personal for that. Um, Anna, we're having a hard time hearing, so I'm gonna ask you a, a follow-up question that everyone else can answer afterwards, but we just need you to put your mouth closer to the mic. Um, like so with saying all of that, what is something that you know now that you wish you knew when you were making your film? To hold a little, to hold on to your feelings a little bit less because the film became so personal and I was the director, the screenwriter. Um, I was also the editor and as a, an independent filmmaker, that's not good at all because you don't get to see your film through another perspective. So a thing that I see now that I didn't see before is that um, 
I have to work in order to stop getting money with filmmaking because independent filmmaking is pretty exhausting and doing that film was that like I was a black young woman trying to make films in Brazil and working in different areas and so I think that's the main thing that I learned Okay, um, Alicia, how would you answer that same question? Do I need to repeat it or? <laughs> nah, you good. <laughs> um, so I would say to not uh, focus so much on what others or people who are viewing the film is going to think. I think I focus a lot on, oh, is this, how are they gonna read this and all that. And I should have just kind of focused on how I wanted the story to go. Um, so definitely next time I'm going to probably trust myself more and stop second guessing what others might think. That, that uh, sounds like great advice to your past self. Um, VT, what about you? Um, I think for this particular video, and I think with this particular video, it was the one project, one, yeah, the one project where I wasn't involved from the jump from the very beginning and it also was one where I didn't do the original treatment I didn't um you know make up an idea for the music video or the storyline and for me um what I learned the most from it is like the beauty of like actual collaboration between a music artist and a and a director and the crew um in so many other instances I was involved from the beginning to the end and so this particular project taught me how to let go, <laughs> how to let go after I leave set. It was the first time I got to set, I directed and then I left and I was involved with the editing to a certain degree, um, but I didn't have to have final say and there was something really beautiful about that, the process of like not trying to control things and not trying to be there through the whole process, which I am and so all the other work that I've done for the most part aside from music videos and even with the other music videos, um, you know, I wrote the script or I co-wrote the script um, or I developed the entire treatment and for me that was really beautiful and it it reminded me of the different ways that, that filmmaking and the filmmaking process can look and feel um, and that I want to be more open to other ways of collaborating that force me to let go of my control issues <laughs> okay between the last two who were always the first two who wants to go <laughs> um, I was gonna say that um, you know, I never really desired to do like camera work. That's not really what I entered filmmaking for. I was really much into like working with actors and concepts. So I think next time I will try to employ more camera knowledge. I mean, I don't necessarily apologize for, you know, my crude camera work, but you know, I would like to at least employ some more skills. I think and one thing I do grapple with sometimes is like the content of my piece and um, really sitting with it and understanding what my intention was some of it did just kind of come together, but I feel like there was something something that happened that I could take time to really explain what I was actually doing in my piece, so, yeah. Um, it's a hard one because it still like bothers me, but um, I think that the lesson, I know that the lesson is to trust myself, um, I, it was very important to me and my co-director that our crew, um, uh, was as black as possible and, um, had as many, um, women, non-binary folks who don't identify as men, um, on set. And we were in a pinch, uh, closer to when we were shooting and we ended up going with, uh, a white cinematographer and that was just such a mistake um we yeah it was just like very difficult to uh rein him in and not have him take over the project and set um and so yeah it was a struggle and i think that it wouldn't have gone that way had i trusted myself um in the beginning knowing that um that was really a role that needed to be um, that needed to be housed by a black person um, and a black femme. 
And yeah, I mean, we dealt with it. And in the end, you know, we really made sure that we got the images that we wanted and that we got the uh, product that we wanted, but it was very, very difficult and it didn't need to be that way. Well, that's interesting. I was not, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> um, Jasmine, I want to get into audience questions before we do like the last question that I have for filmmakers. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. We're actually getting some really good questions. Um, so the first one was like more of a comment, but I actually do have a question. Um, Walter Broughton, he says, I'm actually interested in the film, in a film that expands on the Queen of Hearts story. Um, so Keisha, do you think that you will um, adapt it into a future film or do you have any interest in that? Yes, so when we originally wrote the film, it was as a feature. Um, so we have content for a feature film and we actually had to kind of pare down uh, and decide what we wanted to showcase as part of the story in the short film. So there are purposely a lot of pieces that you don't quite understand or aren't uh, quite tied up in a bow at the end because we wanted to leave that open uh, for potentially making a feature, uh, potentially a series. I kind of feel like it's the Black Game of Thrones. <laughs> I can see that. So yeah, definitely um, there's more work to be done there. Nice, nice. And more to share. Awesome. This question is for Alicia. What was the emotion you felt as you saw the animated recreation of your father? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> that's from yeah. Dominic Ray. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, I think that I feel like this healing when I watched the film. Um, it definitely was this deep dive into myself while creating it. So watching it can be, um, I just, I feel like I feel a different feeling every time I watch it, depending on the day. But yeah, definitely when I watch it, it's mostly just healing and just like love for that film. That really was a beautiful tribute. Oh, thank you. Uh, Follow-up question. Uh, what inspired your storytelling and animation style? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, I want to say Disney, even though like, at the same time I don't. But yeah, I grew up watching Disney films a lot. And the idea, like I mentioned before, of a happy ending was just so like meaningful to me and helped me kind of um, just get through that part of my life. So I really want to give that back to others, the idea that um, no matter like how tough the situation you're going through, there's always going to be like this happiness at the end. So that's kind of how I want my storytelling to be. That's nice. And we have a question for Brittany. Uh, can you speak more about the political commentary you were making with your film, especially with the Barbies? And that's from Alexis McKinney. Hey, a political, um, I think that the, the dolls pretty much represented um, kind of how we're trained to uh, view ourselves. I started with the conflict between two dolls that eventually have to come together in order to get out of a really tough situation. Um, and I think that sometimes the, the beauty standards and those who control those standards uh, are really pitted against, are really bargaining of pitting us against each other. And um, I think I just wanted to start with a conflict that ended up in a desperate resolution. So, yeah. cool. Let's see what other questions we have here. So it says, Chelsea says, ladies, thank you for all your amazing work. Will it be possible to view these films in the future? Or is it, do you all have any plans for distribution? Um, can we find it on your website? Yeah, you could definitely find mine at aliciarob.com. You can also see some storyboards and some concept art of how it was created. Yes. Oh, Mine is not available yet. Right, Ani, you're uh, Anna, you're muted. 
So now, Repeat that. Yeah, I can hear you now. So unfortunately, we um, are still circulating in festivals. So after three years, we're going to do a pet YouTube. Anyone else? Yeah, um, a Black Girls Country is on YouTube and Vimeo. You just type it in and it'll pop up. That's dope. Slay's um, video is online on YouTube. You just search Slay Clark, Miss America. I just want to make sure we send all our views to his YouTube page. And then, um, and it also lives on my website, uh, nine, number nine, knee like your knee .com. So my project was funded by Bravo. Uh, so originally it was supposed to be available there. Um, and the fund shut down, long story short, we're um, looking for um, a permanent home for it. Um, but it will also be available on my um, on my VTape. So VTape is a distributor in Toronto uh, and worldwide. Uh, so it's vtape.org and under just search under my name, Keisha Williams, and it'll be available there along with my other work. Yeah, um, so I'm still, I've been pretty much touring this film for the past, I think this is year two. I made this in early 2018. Um, so I haven't put it online yet, but you can follow my Instagram at Brits and Kofa at Instagram to kind of see where it's showing next. Um, like um, Keisha said, I would like to have a permanent home for it eventually have been approached, but you know, we'll see. <laughs> uh, and this question is for Anna. Can you talk about being, oh, I lost it, sorry. Can you talk about being a black woman filmmaker in Brazil and how the stories you're telling and struggles you go through may be a little different? Oh my God, tough question. Tough and easy, because the, the answer is um, hard. So I think that surviving is the actual word for it. Um, I think that the key is gathering with other black women and make your films with other black women with uh, a black cast, a black crew, and that's what we've been trying to do. We are also creating film festivals dedicated to black women as well here in Brazil, which I think is amazing and fantastic. And that's it. Walking, surviving, trying hard, doubting yourself a, a thousand times and stepping up all over again. I think that you all agree to that in your country and that's it. And it was not um, different making this film um doing independent uh, films is already tough and distributing it is a tough one as well because your film is not accepted everywhere i think that we have at first to start creating our own um grounds to debating films i think because white film festivals don't really get our stories and they don't think that they are meaningful and eventually you start to believe in it, you know, and you start doubting yourself and you think that your film is not going to be seen or liked. You get afraid to talk in front of people about your film because people don't really get it, don't really feel a thing. And that's why it's so hard. But I think that is really thing, like seeing other black women, Brazilian as well, producing and resisting. That's kind of how it is. That's the, uh, the beauty of Black Film Supremacy Film Festival, that you all yes. have a community around Black film filmmakers, and we have a place to go and hope to see more uh, organizations like this and more festivals like this, because I do think each and every one of you have like an audience out there and there's someone that's relating to the story. And so um, we do have to be our own gatekeepers. Can I just interject really quick on what Anna was talking about because this festival is highly uh, influenced by black Brazilian filmmakers. Um, the origin story being that I like found my artistic voice when I lived in Salvador, mainly oh. because I was hanging out with 
black Brazilian filmmakers. Um, That's how I met you, Julia. Yeah, yeah, Julia you. Moraes. Um, yes. All the Julias, there's so many Julias. Um, Cine Quebradas is like Cine a great Quebradas, group. Yes. Um, what we'll do on our Instagram is kind of just go through and, and show all of the folks that we really, really follow and, and are influenced by because as quiet as it's kept, Black Brazilian film is amazing. Like the few films that are able to come out are always just spectacular. So it's always been my favorite uh, country to just keep That's an eye out on in regards to what people are doing and how they're getting it done because it is so inspiring to see folks do so much with so little um and i don't know if anyone saw recently but ava recently ava duvernay who made this possible because me and jasmine met at the racing summit um but she recently had like a ig takeover with a series of black brazilian filmmakers who just talked about like their lives and all of that stuff so it was so great so that you know, was great. when we talk about like, you know, international film, we're thinking about like France, right? Because French film is a thing and Italian film is a thing. But Brazilian film, specifically when we think about like film of the diaspora, is really something to to study. So just wanted to make that note. Yes. We have one more question and then I'll let you um, Nia ask your, your question uh, to the filmmakers. Uh, this question is for Nia June. What was your process for choosing models in your film as well as what was your thought process with including the ballerinas? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I didn't necessarily think of it as choosing models, but more so just real people. So um, a lot of just surfing through social media and anyone that I would connect with, I felt kind of awkward sometimes, like asking people, like women that I would just meet, like I'm working on a film, do you want to be in it? But it was really just an energy thing and people that I felt like I needed needed to be represented. And I wanted to get people who are like me and people who are nothing like me as well. And also show, you know, cause this was in Baltimore. So I also wanted to get people who would be a familiar face to a lot of people. Um, and what was the second part of the question? And the second part was um, why, I guess, why did you decide to include ballerinas? Um, in the dancers. Right, so um, I danced for most of my life. That's actually me dancing in the beginning and the end of the film. So that's just another language for me, just like poetry, music, and the images. Dance was just another way to communicate what I was trying to say. And I wanted to show the different type of dances as well. Like we have the girls, the middle school girls in the middle of the street doing like Baltimore club mix dance. And then you have the ballerinas inside of the studio. So just something else to contribute to the complexity of black womanhood and black girlhood, essentially. Awesome, awesome. Okay, Nia, do you wanna take it away? There was one question in the chat that I saw um, that I guess could lead into two things. Um, Nadine asked, how has experience in your film I guess via this way digitally informed your filmmaking process or inspired you in any way. And I guess the follow up to that would be what has creating in quarantine been like for you. So either or both, that's, that's what we want to know. Um, I can start. So I, um, so my film originally premiered on YouTube. So this is like home watching it on the computer. Um, actually seeing it in theaters at the, the film festival, the Black Film Supremacy Film Fest last year was a surprising thing. But um, creating in quarantine has been a relief for me because naturally I'm an introvert and it gives me more time to to be in just my own world, literally in my own thoughts. There's never traffic. There's, you know, not a lot of crowded spaces that I have to be in. So it's a lot of me. And um, 
it's just been nice. It's more space for me to create. Now filming, there are a lot of films I'm working on and that's been kind of hard because we have people who are afraid, which makes sense. And then we also can't film too much at once because that's not safe. So executing the creation has been hard, but just creating itself has been soothing. And I feel, I don't know, I just feel much more at peace and willing. Taking the screening virtually, uh, I like that we have our international filmmakers here. Um, that's something I've always wanted to happen. So it's nice to have that. Um, and one thing that I guess I miss about having it public is the conversations that happen afterwards, particularly during the, um, the initial screening of it. We just had a really great, I attended a lot of really great conversations that happened after each screening. So that is one thing that I miss, but I'm so happy to be here. And thank you so much for having me. For me, it's been, it's really great because I actually have never shown anything that I've done online and people start like asking, what do you do? Which films do you make? And, oh, I can't put into the internet because it's like in festivals and stuff and quarantine, it's been like this to me because people are being able to watch it and to talk about it and uh shout out to black films to film supremacy it was actually the first um international film festival i have ever been accepted in my career which was in 2000 and 2018 with the first uh short film i i did and now we are here again that's a blast for me and i'm very excited to be here because I think that that's what we need to talk with other black women who experience the same the same thing that you do in cinema and that's it I love it um, being uh, online was amazing uh, it was really lovely to have the chat and to see people actually reacting to moments um, because like in the absence of not hearing people kind of grunt or jeer um, and I love that part of watching uh, with audience especially watching with black audiences because um, I find white audiences are really really quiet but um, yeah so that was really fun and awesome just to get people's like um, in the moment reactions to what was happening and in terms of quarantine creation um i would say that i'm like surprising myself with how creative uh i'm able to be right now like ideas are literally spilling out um faster than i can write them down sometimes which is not a place i've been in in many years and so that's just really exciting and um so yeah i'm kind of sitting tight and being present with what's going on in the world, um, but also really going inward and um, yeah, just like spending some time figuring out what I want to communicate with the world um, and just being creative for me. Um. It's it's so funny doing music videos because I love music videos and I want to do music videos forever and it's always I don't it's I think in Canada it's different from the U.S. because there's not a lot of labels so there's not a lot of labels and a lot of artists are not signed here so they don't get a lot of funding and like Keisha mentioned like Bravo Fact was a big fund for us to help fund music videos and short films no longer exists because someone decided to get rid of it so we have the like double edge I don't want to say double edge sword but we have the the complicated reality of like having a really great funding system here like at the national level provincially or as we would call statewide or provincially and then locally but then so many black indigenous and other filmmakers of color rarely get the funding that we deserve because we don't fit into the traditional um whack ideas of what a filmmaker is and what a professional catalog is and so, you know, when we look at, when we're doing music videos here, it's so wonderful to do them and they're always wonderful and they're a labor of love and it's really a collective effort. But this is really beautiful because you kind of post it on YouTube and 
Um, if they're not a major signed Toronto artist, of which I'm sure you guys know those folks, <laughs> um, they don't usually get the views that they deserve. And so we don't really get to communicate with audiences in the same way. So this is really nice because you know, you put all this work into it for months and then you post it on YouTube and you hope it gets some views and you see some comments and usually they're great, sometimes they suck. And that's kind of the end of the life of the music video. It just lives on forever online. So this is really a blessing and I'm really grateful um, to the festival for um, allowing us to have this conversation. Um, in terms of quarantine, I mean, I'm someone who struggles with my mental health a lot. Like depression is not new to me. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, it's something I struggle with for most of my life. And so I'm usually an introvert, but the, the capacity not to have the freedom to leave and go to a coffee shop, even though I don't really go to coffee shops often, it's that freedom aspect feels really, um, constricting and trying to balance between creating, but you know, so much of our work is being online. Like, you know, I watch films and I watch TV, but then I don't want to sign into Twitter too often because I don't want to read too much. And I think we're all dealing with like a collective sort of grief and then like very personal griefs based on what your family and loved ones are going through. Um, so I'm just trying to like navigate my own mental health and be, you know, and not, uh, give up and give in to the idea of productivity as the, you know, as capitalist structures have <laughs> suggested for us and really be kind to myself and remind my friends who are artists to be kind to themselves and it's okay to like do the bare minimum because that's still more than anything. Um, and then in terms of actual production, like we're, I guess, like so many other places opening up things by phases and production is obviously not in phase one <laughs> um, in, here in Toronto and so just I have uh, two pickup days to finish my feature. I'm kind of sitting on a first cut and we, we can't shoot. So I don't really know when that's gonna be possible. So when we can actually finish work or start or go to production. Um, and it's gonna be fascinating to see how festivals continue to look over the next year and a half or maybe even two years because um, a lot of us can't create as fast as we would have otherwise with or without support. So a lot of questions and just trying to like sleep and eat well and go for walks. <laughs> so next, uh, I agree with uh, what a lot of um, what everyone was saying. I think that virtual um, screenings are a little more accessible to like filmmakers internationally and audiences who might not be able to like go and see film festivals. So I really like that aspect of it. Um, and then, it was really fun to like watch the live comments. <laughs> I thought that was entertaining. Um, and in terms of quarantine, um, I guess uh, I there is like aspects where I feel like I can't really create because I get inspired by going out and having experiences, seeing my friends and things like that. But at the same time, art has become um, the sort of therapy for me and I, that I'm creating things that I want rather than what I think others might want. So um, that's the positive side, the quarantine and my art process. Is that everyone there? That was everyone? Okay. Um, Jasmine, did you have questions for me? Um, I do have some questions for you. So I know that uh, you did mention that uh, how uh, Black Film Supremacy Film Festival started a little bit, but if you can kind of give us some background information on like, you mentioned your experience in Brazil and then you came back, what um, led you to starting the festival? What was that like? This is, I believe, going to be your third year? Yes. Correct. Uh, um, it's a really long story. I wrote about it for, I wrote about it, I guess, a few weeks ago now. So you can find like the whole origin story via a Medium article on our Instagram. Um, it's like a cool collage with the number three on it if you feel like reading. Um, so technically, this will be our third year large festival. This will be our second year doing a taste test screening. Um, it's a lot. It's just a lot, <laughs> so I can't really give like a concise answer. But I mean, essentially, I just, I'm also a filmmaker and an artist. I had been traveling for a long time and I realized that not everyone ex was experiencing what I was experiencing. 
Um, I would go into spaces and people would complain about like, I've never seen this or I can't see this and da da da. And I was just like, kind of casually in touch with like people who were doing great work that if we weren't Facebook friends or if I didn't know that it was on YouTube, I really wouldn't know where to find it. Um, and I had been volunteering at festivals for a long time. When I was in Brazil, I was doing a screening night um, via Media Etnia in, in the center of the city to kind of encourage folks to get together and learn different languages. So it kind of all just made sense. Um, and the festival itself, like an actual festival, didn't come into fruition until 2018 in the spring when I had to do weekend programming for my solo art show. Um, and I just thought it would be like a stunt, a one-off. It was also kind of a reaction to not being hired as the volunteer coordinator at Maryland Film Festival. Um, and then from a Google form, I got like the team, Sama and Hilda uh, were growing now. So there is also Danielle and Zoe, and of course my best friend Maya and Jordana. Um, so it's just been a crazy ride, like just immense success because there's an immense need. Um, so yeah, more about that is on our Instagram page, BFS Film Fest. Oh, at BFS Film Fest and at our website, bfsfilmfest.com. Um, did that answer your question? Yes, that did answer my question. Um, my other question for you is that, especially related to tonight's shorts, but to the theme this year is legacy. So can you talk a little bit about that theme and uh, how um, so legacy this year last year we did access which is kind of crazy because like like i knew like when i was doing this i knew that we were going to be ahead of the curve and i knew that what we were doing was right but like each year it's just getting more like confirmed that we've been ahead of the curve last year was access last year we were trying to have like virtual things going on but we just didn't have capacity last year um our our theme and our aesthetic was literally everything that's happening this year. So um, because we had already been to the future, I'm like, all right, I think we need to consider our past and talk about how they're cyclical. And I had the Sankofa symbol tatted on me. Um, I saw this older woman with these beautiful blue cornrows on a bus and I sent that image to my best friend and I was like, let's like do something cool about like cycles. And I couldn't find the right word. I was thinking of like longevity fruition like all of these things like, oh, it's legacy like that's the word duh and then you know 2020 is such like a cool number it's like you know just 2020 it feels like you gonna live forever or whatever right. um so we said legacy and it's interesting now considering you know where we are as a global community and and so many parts of our legacy are, are changing swiftly like we're literally living in that yearbook paragraph right now so not your book history book paragraph right now so it'll be really interesting to see what the legacy that we're building right now looks like um so that was that was the theme and i'm excited we've been getting a, a decent amount of submissions we're still going strong it'll more than likely be virtual this year um we just launched the membership which if you want more information about that you can find it on our website but we have different levels, like our alum who screen with us, our volunteers, they get a certain level. Um, then we also have Seed and Spark consultations for, for folks who sign up. We have a script analysis session with Moon Ferguson, who created this dope web series called uh, Juju. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's really great. Um, we have merch. So I'm giving away these like really cool pins. Let me see if I can do my, my YouTube. <laughs> um as i think it's upside down so this is like our our play button which i love we're giving away i think 10 of these to the first black and purple level members to sign up and then we have about 50 patches to the first 50 um sl smaller level folks to sign up um it's pretty affordable it's a year-long subscription if you will year-long membership to help support us um as you know it's a lot going on in the world we've unfortunately lost a few grants because everything is kind of going into COVID 19 relief so we're not as high priority for folks but we want to be able to continue to bring folks this type of content virtually or in person whenever that happens again so that is like 
the next initiative. We're also going to be doing exclusive Zoom Q and A's with some really interesting folks that I've met who are in the industry. The first person being Shannon Houston, who's a writer on Little Fires Everywhere. She's also a writer on the upcoming um, Jordan Peele show, Lovecraft Country. She's been a long time, like quiet sponsor of this festival for a while. So I'm really excited to kind of get her on Zoom and ask her questions. Cause at the end of the day, I'm a filmmaker too. So this is my fake education, like my free education. Cause I don't know if and when I'm going to film school. So a lot of the things that I do are completely selfish. Um, so yeah, I'm just excited to continue to grow in whatever way it looks like, cause you know, we're resilient more than anything. Oh, so for all of our filmmakers that are watching this, I know we have a lot of folks in Houston. Um, you all are based out of Baltimore, but you're going virtual this year. How can filmmakers apply this year and what's the deadline? So our early submission deadline was April 19th. Um, our regular submission deadline is June 29th. Um, so right now, regular deadline fees, I believe, are around $35. But if you get a membership, which I forgot to say, you get a flat rate submission fee of, don't let me lie, $20, $25 flat rate submission um, if you join the festival. So look into that. Um, but yeah, regular deadline is June 29th. So you got, what, about a month now? To, to send them in if you're gonna do it this year. Um, and we're right on Film Freeway. You can find all of this information and more on our website. Oh, that's a good segue. Um, how can we all keep in touch with uh, everybody? What are your Instagram handles, Twitter handles, website, so we can keep following you guys, or you ladies? Well, we're, our Instagram page has everyone's info. Um, but if they all want to shout them out now, they can do that. Mine's pretty easy. I'm at Keisha on Instagram. Uh, Keisha creates on Facebook. KeishaWilliams.com um, is my website. I'm also on Patreon. So Patreon slash Keisha. You can find me on Instagram uh, as Anna.Tarmo.F. And in my Instagram bio, there is the link for my production company, the link of the, the Instagram of the film, and my Vimeo link, Ana.CarmoF. Me and Instagram are on a break right now because that's what it is. <laughs> um, I'm underscore nine, the number nine, K-N-E-E, -E, and the website is also 90.com. Um, yeah, and all the things that I work on are on those pages. Sitting at my desk, so I had my writing utensils, but is this backwards? Yeah, it probably is, damn. I failed, but it's Brit.Sankofa on Instagram. And if you just Google that, you should come up with my website. I'm also on Vimeo and Venmo. I'm just joking, but um, yeah. So you can find me at aliciarob.com, A-L-I-C-I-A. -A. Um, and then Alicia Robinson Art uh, is my Instagram and Alicia Rob Art is my Twitter. Um, my Instagram is Nia June Poetry, so N I A June like the month, and then poetry. And in my bio is the film if you want to rewatch. Awesome! I think that was everyone. Um, so yeah, this has been really awesome. It's been great, a great way to spend Sunday night. Uh, if you want to find out about more events that Houston Museum of African American Culture is putting on, please go to HMAC hmaac.org, subscribe to our email um, list. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Houston Mac, uh, that's at Houston M-A-A-C. Um, and- Thank you, Jasmine. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, this has been beautiful. So, all right, everyone, good night. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks, y'all. Have a good night. Nice. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.